Thank you all for, for joining this talk on developing a best-in-class deprecation policy for your APIs. So most likely we've all worked with a platform or a suite of APIs that didn't behave the way we might have expected them to. Um, and maybe it sounds a little something like this. So you open up your computer on a Monday morning, you throw on your favorite playlist to keep the vibe up after an amazing weekend, and you go to access the same software that you use every week. But then maybe you run into something a little like this. So you notice that one of your core services is throwing you know, some kind of error, it's not responding. Essentially, something's not working anymore despite no recent changes on your end. And you and your team might spend the next two hours trying to figure out what's wrong. Only to find out that after investigating and reaching out to a dependent service, um, actually a critical endpoint that you rely on has been deprecated. This is extremely frustrating, right? Uh, chances are you've experienced something like this. And while it's super frustrating, it's actually entirely avoidable. So in the next 25 minutes or so, I'm gonna walk us through how to develop you know, a best-in-class policy that honors transparency and avoids the pitfalls of these frustrating situations. So first, a bit more about me. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Miro. I've been in the API and developer relations spaces, you know, as I was just saying, um, for six or so years at different organizations like Miro and Zoom. Um, at Miro, uh, I work on our developer platform, which extends the power of our visual collaboration, collaboration platform uh, via our APIs uh, and our SDKs as well. I'm really passionate about you know, all things API related and the interconnectedness of the web, um, which is why I've always found a way to make sure that my work touches on this. Um, I've been through several deprecations at different organizations over the years. Uh, so I'm really excited to touch on some of these themes. So. Uh, speaking of themes, these are the main ones that I want us to have top of mind when it comes to developing this type of policy or documentation. So first is the why. Uh, why do we do deprecation and why does it matter? Uh, next, developer trust. So you're going to hear me say this a lot in the next few minutes, but it's really at the core of, of developing this type of policy. Uh, execution. So we'll walk through a brief case study um, and, and give a concrete example and uh, retirement. So a timely retirement is ultimately what any good deprecation policy aims to enable. One thing to keep in mind throughout uh, this you know, presentation as well is that a lot of these principles um, you know, aim to uh, talk about this through the lens of APIs, but actually this can be applied more broadly to deprecation of any kind of service or software really. Um, so just something you know, to keep in mind for uh, today's discussion. So uh, to kick, to kick this off, uh, what exactly is deprecation? So one of the most important aspects of developing a clear, thoughtful policy is ensuring the definition of the subject matter is concrete and universally understood. So if you or your team aren't clear on the definitions, you can't really expect your developers, your end users, uh, whoever is using your services to be clear on the documentation surrounding it. So you know, this is the formal definition from Titter, uh, Twitter. And uh, you know, essentially, it just says that the feature is no longer supported once it's deprecated. No new functionality is going to be added to it. And if there are bugs or something like that, they may not necessarily fix them. And retirement means that the feature is actually no longer accessible. So uh, while I chose to share Twitter's definition because I find it to be really clear and concise, uh, definitions vary. But the overarching theme and structure to deprecations remains the same, and that is that you first have you know, a period of time where use of an API or an endpoint is limited or discouraged. Um, and then you have a second period of time, which is permanent, where use is actually not viable. It's impossible at this point because it's been decommissioned or retired. So understanding the end goal of this type of policy, which is a timely retirement, um, you know, this is kind of you know, holistically the two parts. And uh, I think now that we have a sense of kind of these two definitions, you know, um, why do we need to deprecate APIs in the first place? So healthy APIs and services are constantly evolving and the capabilities available in your API today could very well be outdated or no longer necessary, perhaps even irrelevant to your product in time. New versions or capabilities are often gonna be replaced, um, you know, or older versions are often gonna be placed, replaced by new versions and uh, because these are going to become less reliable and less necessary, uh, most likely as a result of less time and resources being spent keeping them up. So this is where deprecation comes in. Uh, we need a way to handle these older versions and ensure that developers and end users 
are always deferring to your latest and greatest capabilities. So, you know, deprecation is a way to offload the support and resources that were being used for your older versions so that you can actually focus those on continuing to evolve um, and expand your latest versions. Okay, so at this point, uh, we understand what deprecation is. Uh, we have a sense of the ideal end goal, which is a timely retirement. But how do we actually develop a, a policy and documentation that achieves this? So it all hinges on developer trust. Uh, and this has to be at the center of a best-in-class policy. So uh, it's the single biggest risk in developing an, uh, a deprecation and retirement policy. And that's because you're making a commitment, a formal commitment, you know, down on paper, so to speak, for everyone to see that your APIs will function uh, or stop functioning when you say they will. And, you know, developers may rely on your APIs or your services as the backbone of their own services. Uh, so any disruption or, you know, miscommunication is going to be felt downstream. So more succinctly, you know, developer trust is directly correlated to business impact and, you know, the people relying on your services. So how do we actually make sure that we can avoid this risk? Well, we avoid this risk by avoiding ambiguity. So I think we're all familiar with what this can look like. You know, this can look like unclear timelines, you know, hearing someone say, oh, well, we'll think about that sometime in Q4 or we'll get to this early next year. This could also look like a lack of internal consensus. So perhaps you've been in that situation where there's droves of meetings with no concrete actions and takeaways, and perhaps this goes on for weeks with no conclusion at the end or no solid next steps. And lastly, you know, undocumented behavior. So uh, there's an engineering or a product change that wasn't communicated externally, leading to a really confusing end, ex end user experience or developer experience of, you know, is this a bug? Is something wrong? Or did I miss something? So I just want to pause here for a sec to kind of highlight the major theme of developer, developer trust that, you know, I kind of keep harping on here. And that's because, you know, a policy like this should really build and maintain developer trust. And that's because it's so directly related to business impact. You know, even outside of feature sets and capabilities, uh, it's one of the reasons developers actually choose a product. And it relies on uh, you, you making a, a clear, actionable commitment to developers um, and anticipating their needs about how deprecation is going to affect them and their integrations and services. Uh, it's really important to get this right uh, on the first try because you actually only get one shot. You know, if your deprecation strategy or policy reflects any of those, uh, you know, bad kind of qualities that we talked about or those ambiguities, developers are immediately going to start losing faith in your products and your decision making. So truly being aware of the risks and knowing what to avoid is in many ways uh, just as important as knowing what success looks like. If all goes well, you know, you really shouldn't hear too much and retirement should go kind of unnoticed. It should be an uneventful situation. But if things don't go well, you're, you're almost certain to hear about it, right? When there's an issue, people will raise it. You know, developers talk, whether that's through social media, developer communities, on Discord channels. Um, the buck likely isn't going to stop with just one developer who had a bad experience. So what concrete steps can we do to make sure that that doesn't happen? Well, let's talk execution. So uh, up until this point, we've talked mostly about what deprecation is, uh, why it's important, and good versus bad, somewhat in a theoretical sense. Uh, now I want to get into some more kind of concrete guidance uh, with a small case study. So uh, this case study starts with the assembly of your primary stakeholders. And you know, while it's true that almost any strategic initiative within an organization um, you know, has to work cross-functionally like this with product, engineering, customer success, uh, when it comes to developing a deprecation policy for your APIs, it's no different uh, in taking it one step further. You know, in my personal experience, you really need to have one dedicated person. Um, and it almost doesn't matter, you know, from which team they come, but someone to hold, pe uh, hold point on convening, you know, these parties and having a holistic view of all the different moving parts. Um, but even more than that, it, it needs to be somebody who has true empathy for developers. So somebody who's fighting, you know, defending developer interests, 
and pointing out how things are actually going to affect developers in practice when something happens. Uh, you know, at Miro, we have a developer relations team, uh, which in the case of our API deprecation policy served as this, you know, resource to create cohesion amongst this working group. Um, but again, not every organization is set up the same way. This could look like a, a lead product manager, uh, an engineering manager, uh, just somebody who really kind of, you know, gets the developer experience. So what kinds of challenges should this working group be thinking about? Well, um, I'll call this the big three. So these are three very important components uh, to be thinking about upfront as a working group, uh, and at least internally. So uh, first would be timelines. From an engineering and product perspective, you know, when can we be certain, or, or at least as certain as possible, that the release of our new endpoint or service, whatever's replacing our old version, is going to be you know, ready, truly ready. Um, and then from there, we can kind of reverse engineer you know, based on that anticipated readiness, when should we be prepared to publish our policy? You know, when should we be prepared to communicate to customers? At what point should we have our strategy fully drafted? You, know, you can kind of work backwards from there. The next thing is dependencies. So are there limitations? Are there dependencies that could alter this timeline? You know, when you're talking about a deprecation of an API, this could often look like uh, future parity or trying to close gaps between one version and another. So really understanding those dependencies. Uh, and lastly, messaging. So once we have, you know, internal consensus from that working group that we were just talking about, you know, how and when are we going to message the deprecation of our current endpoint or services to end developers? You know, messaging should be well informed by these first two principles here, and it should acknowledge the impact that it's actually going to have on developers. Um, but this clear message should come publicly, you know, only once these first two principles are achieved. And you know, these are three. Uh, big components internally, but there are outside influences uh, as well. So like any good plan, uh, it's invaluable to understand how others externally have tackled the same challenge. And, you know, this is especially important if you are perhaps a younger organization uh, or a startup, you know, less mature product or platform that maybe hasn't actually ever had to deprecate um, a service before. So you know, at Miro, we had a good idea of what our deprecation policy needed to look like, and we did have in-house experience with, you know, previous deprecations, but we still took the time to do our due diligence and, you know, do discovery upfront about other API platforms and their policies. So, you know, you need to ask a few questions to yourself, like, where do your capabilities fit into the standards that you're looking at? Um, you know, where do you need to deviate from what you're seeing? For example, you know, maybe you studied the deprecation policy for a major big tech logo that you see here on the right side of the screen, but you're a less mature organization. Do you really need the same things? Uh, can you leave out some of those more formal definitions or extra things that might not apply to your case? Uh, so in our experience, we did an analysis of several, you know, industry top API first providers uh, to understand what the deprecation landscape looked like and answer some more open questions we had this process should raise more questions. So you should be thinking about things like, you know, will our deprecation policy be part of our terms of service? Will it live on its own? You know, how long should something be deprecated before it goes to retirement? Should the deprecation policy be part of a versioning policy? These are all sorts of things that kind of came up as we started looking into the landscape. Um, so of course, you know, there's no one size fits all solution. Every product and organization is a bit unique. Um, so, you know, my advice here is always Take what makes sense um, and leave out what doesn't. So with this in mind, you know, enough of the kind of theoretical guidance here. Uh, let's take a look at the Miro deprecation timeline to get a better sense of this in practice. So uh, for some context, you know, we used to have a V1 platform consisting of a suite of APIs um, and a web plugin as well, which we then rebuilt from scratch to you know, improve extensibility and developer experience. And this is why we needed a deprecation policy in the first place. And so end to end, uh, coming up with our deprecation policy actually took, you know, several months from initial conversations and discovery to our official policy and document, which we'll show in a little bit. Um, you know, as with most things, this probably could have been done a, a bit quicker. However, we, we did take the time to put in discovery and get internal consensus up front 
avoiding the pitfalls of you know any potentially more hasty actions, uh, which is you know exactly what we're trying to avoid. So another thing to point out here is that we we uh, timed the release of our deprecation policy with our V2 launch to streamline customer communication and messaging. You know, so again, only at the point when we were confident that we knew exactly kind of anticipated timing and what that would look like. So looking here kind of end to end, I'm not gonna read through everything on this timeline because it's a lot, but I'll just point out a few key things. So uh, first, we started with convening a working group, as I mentioned, and incorporating market research like we were just talking about. And this is what helped inform the rest of the timeline. So you see on the right-hand side there that desired retirement date at, you know, in H1 2023. And just before that, our best effort at future parity, closing gaps, you know, some of those dependencies that we aren't going to rush uh, before we retire anything. So in our case at Miro, this was focused primarily around API endpoints that handled specific use cases. You know, in our case, that was connecting Miro objects on a board. Um, but, you know, the point here is you need to be transparent and flexible about, you know, what gaps you have to close before you actually retire something. And that's exactly where another major risk lies, which is retiring an endpoint prematurely. And so, you know, I keep talking about having developer trust top of mind. And when I say keeping it top of mind, I'm really talking about honesty and transparency. So when developers choose to leverage your APIs, they're putting their faith in more than just your product. Um, they're also putting their faith in your team's you know, decision-making and judgment calls. For example, you know, at Miro, we stuck to our internal commitments to publish a deprecation policy by the launch of our V2 uh, platform. But we kept this theme of honesty and transparency at the heart of our policy. And we made you know, a promise to communicate any changes in our timeline accordingly. Uh, we made a promise to assure developers that we weren't just going to retire our V1 endpoints until we felt confident that our V2 endpoints, you know, we're going to be able to accomplish a lot of the same core use cases. So, you know, as the great Steve Jobs once said, you know, when you innovate, you make mistakes, it's best to admit them quickly and get on with improving your other innovations. I think, you know, what I'm really trying to get at here is that developers appreciate it when you keep it real with them so to speak, um, it can be really difficult to achieve certain things like feature parity between versions. And actually you may not always achieve it 100%. Uh, this is something you have to be open about if necessary. So, you know, put more succinctly, you know, business forces you to make hard decisions, but if you are transparent and you give developers as much time, you know, and information as possible, you can still maintain the relationships you've forged with them, despite maybe having difficult news to share. So developing a policy that honors transparency requires you and your team to be realistic about each phase of end of life uh, for your APIs. And this means, you know, remaining nimble and flexible where necessary. As we discussed earlier, you know, deprecation is the first phase of end of life followed by retirement. Um, and while deprecating is most of the battle, the second half of nailing this kind of policy is that you have to ensure your retirement is well-timed. So this means that in this case, you know, taking a long, hard look at how services are performing, adoption, and any other key metrics that may matter to you or your org. You know, if your expectations differ from what you're seeing in reality, you know, forcing a retirement just to meet an internal goal or some other kind of internal pressure is not going to maintain the trust that you've built with your developer ecosystem. In that case, you know, you might consider pivoting. And in some ways, this goes against what people might expect in uh, a deprecation policy. But especially when it comes to retirement, you need to be realistic and you can't shut off a critical infrastructure uh, for your end users or developers just to meet an internal goal. And this is a balance. So it's a balance between external needs of developers uh, and internal commitments you know, in your organization. Uh, executing on the policy you're developing for deprecation and retirement involves constantly checking in with yourself and your working group. So this means keeping in mind the needs of both of these parties. You know, do you have an ability to support or stop supporting a deprecated service and for how long? Do you have the ability to meet the timeline goals that you initially sought? Um, you know, what does this look like in practice? So in our case at Miro, 
this looked like you know keeping at the forefront our history of proactive communication and meeting expectations with developers um, it meant holding our engineering and product teams accountable to deliver key features that were going to help close the gap between one version and another um, you know committing to these things is is one thing but communicating them clearly and, and keeping that balance in mind is is a whole other thing that's that's really important and now so for the big reveal so to speak uh, our official deprecation policy at Miro. So, you know, well, we did come up with a policy that uh, I think it's a great policy. I just want to highlight that the process to get here is, of course, a bit unique for each organization. Um, I won't read this policy out, you know, end to end, but I do want to call out uh, three components here that I think should be included in any deprecation policy as a bare minimum. The first is a concrete timeline. So. In our case, that was a six months period of deprecation. And this was based on, you know, both internal consensus of, you know, that working group and stakeholders internally, as well as industry standards from market research. The second thing is a commitment to, developer, to developers. So this policy should be putting developers at ease to some extent. You know, you should provide them with the resources they need, set clear expectations and communicate accordingly any changes. Um, you should be offering things like migration resources, how-to guides, how to get them easily from point A to point B and have no questions, you know, theoretically in between. And lastly, kind of along the same lines, a clear definition of deprecation and retirement phases. So here's, you know, precisely what to expect in this first phase. Here's what to expect in the second phase. And, and here are the two exact definitions of how we talk about each of these things. You know, a developer reading your policy should be very clear on what words mean, um, and there should be very little room for ambiguity or misunderstanding. So if your policy has at least these three things, it should be clear to developers that they can trust both you and your product. Including these three things, you know, shows that you've kept in mind all the different facets of the process we've talked about so far, but to boil it down um, even further, I would say if, if you can't remember anything I've talked about for the last you know, 20 minutes, um, here's three things to just keep in mind. First, a good policy requires, you know, a cross-functional, cross-functional iterative approach. So remember, we worked across teams and took several months of internal conversations and external discovery uh, to iterate before we felt confident in what we should commit to. And next, developers should be at the heart of your decision making. So ultimately, not only at the heart of your decision making, but the policy itself. You know, if you're in a working group in that initial phase and you're in the room with other teams who don't really understand this or don't understand developers you know it's your job to do your best to you know uh, communicate this and advocate on their behalf and lastly uh, invest as much time and resources early on as possible so you know investing time and resources up front is going to lead to the clearest most intentional policy and actually these three things are not unique to just APIs and an API deprecation policy, but you know, kind of as I was getting at in the beginning, this can truly be applied to uh, a lot of different kinds of software strategy. And with that, um, yeah, I'd love to take some time to answer some questions. Thank you, Will. I have a lot, so I'll quickly, <laughs> <laughs> quickly Great, ask you yeah. before people type theirs. So I guess they also have a lot. Um, so um, you mentioned three things, timelines, dependencies, and messaging. In your experience, which part of these three is usually underestimated? I think dependencies is almost always going to be something that's underestimated. Um, you know, at least in my experience, there's a lot of things that you can, you can take your best guess at what's going to be an issue, but oftentimes things will crop up that nobody was really thinking about or that weren't top of mind. Um, and to some extent, you really have to be ready um, or expect that things are going to pop up that you weren't thinking about. And as best you can, try and bake that into timelines. Um, you know, it's, it's not an exact science, but I do think that's the one thing that always is kind of creeping around in the background. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you also said uh, it's important to avoid the pitfall of uh, more hasty actions. 
Um, have you seen some of these more hasty actions without naming names? What like what would that be and how does that look like in real life where you're between the rock and the hard place? Yeah. I think a lot of times this comes down to internal politics for the product you're working on. So when I was talking about, you know, kind of rushing to uh, retire something because maybe you've made internal commitments uh, with people above you or, you know, stakeholders that expect something to be done at a certain time. But in reality, you know, this kind of policy is for developers. It's for your end users. It's not for your organization. Um, so that's what you have to keep in mind when you're doing this is that, you know, making a hasty decision to actually press the big red button and retire something before you have other services to offer to replace it is, you know, an example of, you know, not keeping the developers at the forefront of, you know, why you've created this policy in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, if I understood correctly, um, you coupled the deprecation with the new version, and you also mentioned look at other industry players. Um, some of them do this. I might be going out on the limb, but why would you? Why and when would you not do that? Yeah, I think it's it's a good question. I think there could be scenarios where um, you know you know you're going to retire your your services at some point, or at least you think you are, and maybe you already have your deprecation policy nailed down and you want to get ahead of the curve and communicate that perhaps, you know, earlier on before you're actually even thinking about launching a new service. I don't think that it's, you know, necessarily the most critical thing in, you know, this whole process, but I think wherever you can streamline communication, it's much more likely that people are going to, you know, get the message and, and really understand everything that you're trying to tell them, as opposed to sending out one communication that, hey, we're going to deprecate this, and then another communication, hey, we've got a new service, and then another communication, hey, we're retiring this. Mm -hmm. If people can have a sense of the full timeline uh, in one communication, I think it's more powerful just because of, you know, we're always getting emails and communications all the time. Any way to streamline those um, is, again, kind of just putting the developers first and their experience first. Mm -hmm. Which channels do matter most when it comes to communicating these deprecation policies, like prominent info and documentation, social media, email, registered users, email? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think first and foremost, probably the most important channel in my mind is email to people who are registered developers on your platform. Those mm -hmm. are people you know are you know, currently using your technology or are engaged in, to some extent. So sending them a, a very like, you know, direct communication is, is kind of critical for this kind of important change. Um, if you're a larger platform and you have a really large user base, I think email campaigns and reminders is also like another really important part of this. Um, you know, if you have like in-app notifications, you know, this is a message that you want to make sure is clear um, and people are expecting it. I think one of the things that often happens with deprecations is that People might see a communication and forget about it, and then it happens and they weren't expecting it. So um, use as many of your channels as possible, you know, while still being reasonable <laughs> um, and keeping in mind that you don't want to over communicate either and, you know, have some of your messages lose some of their, um, you know, credibility. Does this belong on social media? That's a good question. Um, you know, in my experience, uh, it's not something that we necessarily did at Miro, but I have seen it at other organizations. Um, I also think it depends on the type of social media too. You know, uh, for instance, like if your platform is using Discord or something that's really you know technical and, and kind of catered to a technical audience, some, somewhere like that might make sense. But you know, if we're talking about Twitter or other kinds of socials, you know, um, it's kind of one of those things that might be unique to your organization and how you communicate with your developers already. Mm -hmm. When you have hundreds or thousands of API users or clients, what strategies might you use to make sure that all or most of them are aware of the deprecation or retirement? Yeah, I think one you know really important method here is monitoring and trying to use the data that you have at hand. So if you can see the adoption of your new platform, whether that's API calls or API keys that have been generated for your new platform, 
you know, that gives you a sense of how many people are adopting it. And if you can see, you know, a baseline of what you used to have for, you know, your V1 API calls and V1 API keys, those kinds of things, and see if that's decreasing. You know, if you see, you know, if we're talking about a really large organization with a lot of users, you can see a lot of that pretty clearly if you have access to that data. You know, mm -hmm. if you're a smaller organization, perhaps you don't have those same kinds of tools. Um, so maybe there's, you know, something else you need to be doing outside of that. But I think if you have the data, that's a really important way to be looking at it. That would also have been my next question. While you were in this um, transition period of version A to B, uh, exactly which metrics were you looking at specifically for maybe knowing now is not the time yet, not the time, okay, now retirement? Um, yeah. Or did you invent uh, any new metrics or analyze the data differently? Yeah, so to be honest with you, we're actually still in that phase uh, at Miro. So right. we haven't we haven't fully retired our V2 platform and we are in kind of that monitoring feature gap kind of phase that I was talking about on the timeline where, you know, we're not going to rush into a retirement before we've met some of our best effort commitments to, to close some of those gaps. I think a few of the things that we're looking at are, you know, uh, creation of developer teams. So at Miro, that lets us know that someone has started adopting our V2 platform and we can see what kind of application they've created you know, which endpoints they have access to based on that, you know, creation of a developer team. So that's one you know, specific metric kind of unique to Miro that we're looking at. But I think it's, it's similar to what I was just saying about if you have ways to understand um, or see the usage of your existing platform, whether that's API calls per week or, you know, unique API calls per user, you know, there's a lot of different metrics you can look at that can give you a sense of whether things are, you know, going up or down in terms of adoption. Mm -hmm. I see a conflict here. This is nitpicking, but the key advice that I heard is avoid ambiguity and be very clear on the timeline. Yeah. But then I also heard watch the adoption rate and maybe wait with that retirement before it's too early. Yeah, I think, no, it's a fair point. I think it's, it is a bit of both. Um, I think do the work up front to make sure that you can have your best, you know, guess at what will be a reasonable retirement date and if you have a high level of confidence in that you know you can consider sharing that publicly but i think the really important thing here is that we're not all perfect we're not you know we have humans here in the mix and things are going to crop up that maybe we weren't expecting and that's when we want to make sure that if changes have to be made we're not so committed to that that end date that we're unwilling to change it and we're forcing a retirement so it's a balance. Um, yes, you do want to put in the time and effort up front to have a sense as close as possible to when you anticipate that retirement, but not so much that you abandon, you know, the developers that are at the heart of this policy and might still be relying on, you know, your services, even if you think you're close, but you're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. I have one more question. Um, and maybe the audience more. So um, the three parts that's like minimum viable deprecation policy published that you showed us the concrete timeline the commitment to the developers uh how they get help um and clear definition of deprecation and retirement phases what's the extras that you would build up on this yeah it's a good question um i think you know a lot of it depends on the size of your platform the size of your organization for a lot of people, I think those basics are, are probably good enough. Um, but as you start to get into larger tech companies, you know, a lot of them will actually take, you know, sometimes years to retire something. And that, you know, lends itself to other more, you know, complexities as well. You know, you have more time to recognize future gaps. You have more time for people to continue relying on older services. So I think, you know, if you have the ability to add more to a deprecation policy, I would say it's probably around something in that area of just, um, you know, nailing out as many details as you can share publicly without, you know, over committing or over promising to developers. So it's really a balance of finding the detail of what you can share without, you know, without over committing or over promising on what's, what's actually going to happen. Mm -hmm. So as you go along, if I understood correctly, you could widen that 
developer commitment and, and assistance a bit more to the nuances. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, like I kind of touched on this briefly, but migration resources and how to guides, you could start incorporating some of those, you know, into your policy, perhaps as commitments, like in every deprecation, we're always going to have a guide for you to get from A to B. You know, these are things that you may not always offer by default, but if you have more time and you have more resources and you want to expand your policy, these are the kinds of tools that ultimately would make developers' lives easier. So if you can incorporate those, um, certainly I think it's a value add. Mm -hmm. Not APIs, but I have seen this along the years of how Drupal, uh, Drupal CMS came a long way on, on how uh, changes are being communicated and even planned up front from let's figure this out to having a complete and detailed roadmap. That was fascinating to watch. Yeah. Thank you very much, Will, for the presentation. I hope it was for the benefit of many. Yes, of course. And good luck with the further steps uh, now, <laughs> the more sharp ones. And thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you.